Good morning, everyone, or whatever time of day you might be watching this at, uh, those of you who are present, those of you who are watching online later in your small groups, families, or uh, just by yourself, we are continuing our Bible study through the Gospel of Luke, and we are 21 weeks in, which is crazy, uh, but it's been a good time. I've really enjoyed it, and we are at chapter 19, and we're in our um, final weeks of the ministry of Jesus, uh, and then we are about to enter into the next couple of weeks into his, his passion, his death, his resurrection. No spoilers, but maybe you've heard the story before, um, but I'm excited for that part as well as we get to kind of step by step, just follow Jesus along the journey um, and see what God's mercy is all about uh, in his work. So uh, as we begin, let me start us off with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we get to gather to study your word in the midst of the pandemic and everything else for the, the technology uh, and for just blessing us with um, the, the friendship and companionship and, and studying together. You froze. Huge, huge deal. Oh, sorry, everybody. I'm just going to keep talking through the freezing. Uh, hopefully that pans out. But uh, so God, just bless our time together in Jesus name. Amen. Can everybody uh, see me, hear me? Thumbs up. Okay, the stars. Yeah, okay, everybody. Yeah, Hannah can. Thank you, Hannah. All right. Yeah, you know, we might have some internet yes, connection maybe. issues, unfortunately, um, but there's not much I can change. I'm already like wired into the, um, you know, into the, the router. So whatever it is, uh, it will be. So I'm going to go ahead and um, mute everybody as we get started. And then we'll unmute ourselves as we um, yeah, as the, as the time comes. So let's read our introduction for today. After a long journey, right? Remember, this is like chapters 14 through 17, just a lot, a lot of journey and teaching uh, to Jerusalem. Uh, Jesus finally arrives. And in some ways, his reception is appropriate. In others, his reception is greatly lacking. And today we'll unpack some of those themes behind Jesus' reception and witness him making a clear statement upon his arrival at the temple, right? So uh, first in our scripture, we are going to read Luke 19, starting at verse 28 and going through verse 40. And uh, I'll be using the NIV as usual. You might have little differences in translation, but the meaning overall should remain the same, all right? So don't let that distract you. So Luke 19, um, starting at verse 28. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say the Lord needs it. So those who were sent ahead, uh, those who were sent ahead, went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, "Why are you untying the colt?" And they replied, "The Lord needs it." They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives. The whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. That is our first section of scripture here, and uh, let's get to our first question. As Luke enters Jerusalem, Luke emphasizes the joyful response of his disciples. What details of Luke 19, uh, 28 to 38, what we, uh, you know, part of what we just read there, represent appropriate ways for the disciples to honor God's anointed king, right? So this is a pretty straightforward one, but it'll set us up for the next couple of questions, okay? Um, should the people and the disciples be responding joyfully? Yes, they absolutely should. First, because Jesus is worthy of the praise either way. And second, because of the amazing things that Jesus is about to do 
and accomplish. Okay, so um, the disciples, you know, they're, they're throwing their cloaks on the road. Um, they are joyfully praising God, which is very appropriate, right? Because Jesus is the Savior that God has sent to us, okay? So that is appropriate. And um, they are saying, uh, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Yes, Jesus is that king. He comes in the name of the Lord, right? Uh, peace in heaven and, and glory in the highest. Yes, these are all appropriate. They are magnifying God. They are magnifying Jesus. They are celebrating the time that has come. It is in every way appropriate. All right. So um, it, to get into a little bit of the, the detail of this, um, if you are familiar with the Old Testament, different elements in this will look familiar to you, right? Um, a king's entry into the city on a horse, right? Um, that should be pretty familiar. For Jesus, though, it's a donkey. Uh, Jesus is um, a, a humble king, but the element is still there, right? The throwing the cloaks on, on the ground before, um, that is a, a ceremonial uh, reserved for a king. Um, the phrasing, right? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Um, this would be um, something that the people would shout out at the, the return of the king. So this is all appropriate, all of the, the fanfare, all of the celebration, all of the um, not ritual, but the circumstance um, and the phrasing of things, it's all very, very, very appropriate, all right? So that's the answer to our uh, first question here. And what I have here uh, in my notes as well, if um, you are familiar, um, the, the most obvious interpretation of something like this um, would be from Zechariah 9.9. 9. Uh, the, the, the triumphant, victorious, humble king, Jesus comes riding in on that colt. Um, and in, in Israel's history, um, when heirs of David would ride uh, to their coronation, uh, the spreading of the garments on the pathway, um, and, and that, that greeting, that would be very, very appropriate. So long story short, they're doing it right. But it gets a little more interesting uh, than that. And we'll have more questions on this text as we wrap up the section. But here's question number two, okay? The people of Jerusalem were excited to see Jesus, but while their worship is appropriate, it isn't accurate, all right? What kind of savior did they think Jesus was? And how do we already know that they are wrong? Um, you may have heard this in, in sermons before, um, but this comes up quite a lot when we talk about people's expectation of what Jesus would do. And we see examples of this um, in uh, the disciples in their discourse, right? And uh, they'll say things like, oh, Jesus, who's the most, uh, who, who's the greatest among us disciples? And so when you come into power and you take your throne uh, over Israel, well, then can we be at your, your right hand and your left hand? And can we rule with you and over this earthly kingdom and all those kinds of things? So we, we keep getting the sense, including now, that the people, the disciples of Jesus, his followers, they are expecting what people had been expecting throughout the history of Israel, um, that there would be a king in the line of David who would be uh, as great, if not better than David, to lead people in justice and truth, worshiping the Lord, uh, in, in conquest, in prosperity, an earthly king for people, right? Just as God had given them in David, okay? So they are praising Jesus for all that they think he is going to be and for all that they want him to be. Um, but the reason we know that they are already wrong is because Jesus multiple times, including in last week's Bible study, uh, what does he predict, right? What does he explicitly tell them is going to happen when he gets to Jerusalem, he's going to die, right? What earthly king takes his crown with the plan of dying immediately once getting there? It doesn't make any sense. But, you know, let's just forget about that little part and let's get back to the part that we like, right? The part of the earthly king. And so the people, they worship him 
They worship him rightly. He should be worshiped in that way, but they are just not accurate in the posture of their hearts or their understanding of the kingdom that he's about to bring, the work that he's about to do, or the role um, that he's about to take on. Right? So that's the uh, answer to our question number uh, two. And number three, this is going to um, take a lot of thought and reflection and honesty on your part. So I'm going to give some longer time in, um, in our breakout session, okay? And I, so let me read the question here. The people believed in Jesus sincerely, but incorrectly. They worshiped him for who and what they thought he was, not for who he actually was. What are the counterfeit gods in your life, and who is your Jesus? Now, uh, I've talked about this in sermons before, and you know, there's a great book uh, by Concordia Publishing House. It's called Will the Real Jesus Please Stand Up? And let me put this in the chat right now. Um, please stand up, and that's by Concordia Publishing House. You can get it through their website or Amazon. Um, and in that book, it goes through the, well, what are all of the false Christs that we don't know are false Christs? We believe in sincerely, but that's not actually Jesus, right? So there's the mascot Jesus, right? Uh, the, the one who is uh, just ch cheering you on all the time, or, you know, the one, uh, and he's just the encourager. There's Jesus, the therapist, right? And his, Jesus's whole thing is to listen to your problems. You can pray to him. He, he's not going to do anything about it, but it's nice to know that he hears you. Um, there's Jesus, the one option among many, right? People will say, well, I believe that Jesus was a great teacher and, and the son of God, but all religions lead to the same place. And so Jesus is just one expression of, of how God expresses himself. Then there's Jesus, the wise teacher, right? But, you know, he had some great teachings and he was just a revolutionary. The things that he says are just amazing and, and true. But I mean, let's be honest, he's not the son of God, right? I mean, he's just a wise guy. We should listen to what he says, but, but that's about it, right? Then there's Jesus, the, uh, the giver of things, the bestower of gifts. Jesus exists to make us prosper. And those who believe in him will receive good things. Uh, those who don't have enough faith or don't believe will not receive those good things. And so our value uh, or Jesus value to us is for us to get things, okay? Then, of course, there's Jesus the Patriot. And this might be Jesus the American Patriot, where many people believe that America is God's chosen country, and Jesus is the Jesus of America. And of course, he likes America more than others. Maybe there's patriots uh, in Germany who believe in patriotic Jesus, who think, of course, Jesus is the Jesus of Germany. He loves our country. Uh, or, you know, you can have the Russian Patriot Jesus or the Chinese Patriot Jesus, whichever one it is. Um, but he is not the true Jesus, right? Jesus has called all nations to himself. Um, and uh, he certainly in, um, in him and in faith, uh, there are no more borders or ethnicities. We are all the same before him and in him, okay? Then there's Jesus, the social justice warrior, right? Jesus only cares uh, about social justice and about nothing else. Now, we know that that's not true. Of course, Jesus cares about social justice, but not above everything else. And when we use him like that, that's incorrect. Then there's the teddy bear Jesus, right? Oh, Jesus, uh, he, Jesus is my friend, right? Jesus was this nice, he always wore sandals. That's so cool. He was always so mellow. He was just a long hair, groovy dude, right? No harsh vibes. That's Jesus. That's cool. But the only problem with that is that that's not actually what Jesus was like. And we're going to find that out when we get to Jesus visiting the temple later on in our scripture for today. Jesus rebuked people. Jesus spoke on condemnation and hell and judgment. Jesus told people when they were wrong. Uh, Jesus flipped tables. Jesus crafted whips. Uh, Jesus was very quick to point those things out. And so we don't want to be under the delusion that Jesus is, oh, hey, you just do your thing, man. I'm Jesus. I'm cool with it all. You know, that's certainly not Jesus. Okay. So thank you for indulging me as I explained these 
Jesus is, or Jesus, I don't know what the plural of Jesus is. Um, there are more in the book. It's a really good, interesting, thoughtful read uh, that I think can call out a lot of idolatry, even within Christianity. So give it a read if you have the time. But now I want you to think, what are your false Christs? Who is your Jesus? Is it one from this list? Or is there one specific to this time um, where, you know, you got to think about it and catch yourself. And maybe during this reflection, you'll go, oh, no. And I want to encourage you to be honest with your group. These are your brothers and sisters in Christ. We're supposed to confide in one another, share our experiences. So we're no, we know we're not the only ones. We're not crazy. Like this happens to all of us. Um, and, and we'll see how that unfolds in your small groups. So I am going to go ahead and set those up. And in the meantime, as always, uh, I'll explain to our uh, people watching online. I will pause the recording during the breakout groups and you just go ahead and pause the video, answer those questions uh, in your own time. And when you're done, just hit the resume button and we'll snap right back, in, back into it with um, the results uh, and answers for those kinds of things. So I've created the groups. Uh, remember, uh, I'll take you to the groups, accept it, and then let the timer run out at the end. We'll all come back at the same moment. Uh, so see you in a little bit, everybody. Welcome back, everybody. So I hope you introduced yourselves. Uh, I forgot to mention that. Hopefully you're by now no strangers. And maybe you haven't had a good time with each other. Um, so this is... Uh, this is a, a, a tricky one. And maybe that you, you found that uh, for yourself as well. Um, does anybody want to share uh, their temptation, their false Christ, the idol that they, they may lean on or their misinterpretation of, of your Jesus? Um, I would love it if you could share one because uh, the people who are watching at home maybe are, are making this up. Um, they might not have a group and get other experiences. So this might be very... Uh, enlightening for other people and those in the other group as well. I know you're all brave. One of the things our group ah, about- Becky, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Larry, go ahead. Uh, Becky, don't be insulted by the pastor confusing me with you. Um, <laughs> let somebody laugh. We were talking about uh, some of the distractions that keeps us from doing Christ's work for serving Christ uh, are the tasks of daily living. We spend a lot of time doing that, a lot of resources. Yeah, uh, Larry, were you in Bible study two weeks ago? Did I miss the one where everybody was questioning one of your questions that was a yeah that was a couple of weeks ago i think so uh two weeks ago jesus spoke on that actually um and you know he was he was talking about the the last days and when he would come back and be taken from them and he said you know people are going to be busy with you know uh threshing wheat and, and making their beds and all this kinds of stuff and he was essentially telling people you know you need to be aware that I'm coming back and that these are the last days. And so while you need to do your chores and go to work and all those things, don't be so immersed in the present day living and chores and duties that you lose sight of the big picture. Jesus is returning. Uh, so yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, and so if you didn't attend Bible study a few weeks ago on that week, and you get bonus points. And your, heart's in the right, your heart's in the right place. Spoken like a true Jesus. Um, so certainly maybe, uh, yeah, a false Jesus might be uh, the Jesus that cares more about every little thing around you than about the greater picture of salvation. Um, that's a good one. All right. Uh, now our other Larry, Becky, uh, what did you have? <laughs> um, the one I immediately thought of was um i am you know the the jesus that i expect is the one do it right now this fix it right now i don't want to wait <laughs> i want it i want it done now <laughs> oh, so uh, it, we, could we call him amazon prime jesus amazon prime or i always thought like din do it now jesus instead of diy do it now jesus like that kind uh. of stuff. 
Oh, well, good good luck with that, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got my my you know my best interest at heart to grow me Nothing into wrong. something, right? And I want it oh. done now. <laughs> Oh, got another email. There's another shipping delay. Okay, Jesus, right? Um, wow, thank you, Becky. I appreciate that. You know, I can I can share one of mine. Um, one thing that I, I really struggle with, um, and this might be unique to me, it may not, and it may be surprising because uh, I am a pastor and people usually don't think we, <laughs> we, don't, we don't struggle with nothing, right? Especially our faith. Um, but no, it's, it's very, it's very much um, the opposite. So in, in this current season of life, um, and, and quite often, actually, I am, I, I believe uh, falsely in a Jesus who takes care of everyone else, um, but maybe not about me, right? And uh, the, the, the false idol that I tend to worship is the, um, the, the Jesus that, um, Maybe, uh, maybe I should worry about the clothing that I wear or what I eat or where I live um, because, you know, maybe God has forgotten about me or he, he won't forgive me or he will give up on me, all those kinds of things. And so, uh, unfortunately, uh, there are times when I doubt that all of the good things that God has for his people don't apply to me because uh, I'm, I'm still sinful after all this time. Uh, so, so that's a tough one. And, um, you know, another, I, I would say, yeah, yeah, that, that would probably be my biggest one. So uh, it's been a, it's been a weird couple of, uh, of years. Uh, and as you know, it's, it's very cool to be a millennial um, <laughs> between the student debt and then being iced out of the housing market. That's awesome. And so every, every day I always tell Hannah, like, man, I really want a house, but the prices keep going up. What do we do? And so uh, for me, I'm trying to not make my Jesus the home buying Jesus um, and, and trusting in him to provide uh, in, in different ways in his own time. Um, so those are, those are a couple of my uh, struggles and sinfully so. I, I, I repent of those on a, on a very frequent basis, but it uh, keeps creeping in there. Does anybody else have, uh, have one? Well, maybe you're all on the right track with the right Jesus. All right. That's not bad news. Um, but again, if, uh, if I recommend the book, um, it's, a, it's a good one. So uh, any questions about this section, um, 28 through 40? If you have any uh, questions, any comments, now would be the time. OK. Uh, John Stoltz, welcome to Bible study. Uh, if you are on your study guide, we are just we just wrapped up question three, and we will go to the second section of scripture, which will be Luke 19, 41 through 44. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, I'll read that for us, and um, then we'll get into our next question. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embarkment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. That's our next section of scripture. So we're getting a little more intense there, right? Uh, number four is also a breakout. It'll be our second and, and last breakout. Uh, and this will require some reading in your breakout rooms. Okay. Jesus shatters the mood of celebration by predicting the destruction of Jerusalem and enacting judgment on the temple. Right? How do we're not quite at that temple yet, but so save that one for, for later. But how do Isaiah 53, 3 through 8, and Jeremiah 7, 1 through 11, shed light on the reasons behind the judgment that Jesus brings? Okay. Um, so let's go into our breakout groups again. Those who have not been assigned, I'm going to try to assign you right now. Actually, it looks like we may be all assigned. Uh, or I'll, I'll fix it once we do it, but I'll open the rooms. 
we'll get a couple of minutes and then we'll all come back at the same time. All right. So um, Jeremiah comes back in, right? And for those of you who are uh, listening to the sermon today, um, this is not going to be a difficult Bible study, but woe to you who did not listen. No, I'm just joking. Um, so <laughs> um, Jesus shatters the mood of celebration by uh, predicting the destruction of Jerusalem and enacting judgment on the temple. And how do those two scriptures shed light on the reason behind the judgment that Jesus brings? Well, uh, in Jeremiah, we see that Israel is a people who habitually abandon God, who misunderstand them, who choose their own ways, who do what is detestable to the Lord and give into words of deception and practices that are contrary to his will. Long story short, Israel is not a faithful people, okay? They don't worship God for who he is. They don't worship God how he should be worshiped. And they don't live the way in which he has told them to live. And that is a recipe for disaster and destruction and death. Okay. This says, uh, with the advent of Jesus here, this takes on uh, a twofold meaning, right? Uh, and, and we'll get into one of them a little bit later regarding the destruction of the temple. Um, but we do have a repeating theme pop up here in Isaiah 56, right? This is all centered around the foreigner and how the Lord interacts with the foreigner. Now, remember Jesus' first sermon when he preached it and he said, listen, if the Jewish people aren't going to accept this revelation from God and this salvation, I'll give it to the Gentiles. I'll give it to the foreigners. And they wanted to throw him off of a cliff. Now, you might remember why they wanted to do that. The people of Israel were convinced that, well, they were God's people and God was their God. And so salvation was for them. They were the chosen, specific, special people, and they would receive salvation alone, if not first, right? But usually alone, right? It was just for them. And so for Jesus to say, you know what? It's for the foreigners too. It was outrageous. It really cheapened the gift. It really made them insecure in their relationship with God because they didn't understand uh, what God's salvation and restoration for the world was really all about, okay? And so now we have, um, you know, God saying in Isaiah, right, whether it's the, the foreigner or a eunuch, if they keep the Sabbath, if they honor my name, um, if they do all of those things, they bind themselves to the Lord. They become my servants. They become my children. They become people of my covenant, and um, their sacrifices are accepted. Um, all nations will be acceptable to the Lord. And so this is Old Testament scripture. This is clearly something that God has told us that we should be aware of and that the people should have seen and known, but they don't. And so when the time actually comes for the king to enter, to bring the real kingdom and salvation and freedom and, and, and uh, inclusion and family of God, no, well, they can't see that. Jesus is only going to be the king of Israel. Jesus is only going to be our earthly king. He's going to take care of us. We're going to be victorious over other nations, but, but that's it regarding the other nations. They just don't receive it. So A, they reject the Lord's ways, uh, and, and B, they reject um, the Lord's actual plan of salvation, and they don't understand the, the means of salvation um, that is coming and for whom it is, Okay. Um, so that makes them deserving of judgment, right? They reject the actual thing that God is doing, um, and they instead are looking out for or hoping for or projecting onto Jesus something that they are, you know, imposing onto him and wishing that he would do. But no matter how you look at it, the people of God are unfaithful in the midst of God's coming kingdom and in the advent of Jesus' work of his death and resurrection and his passion, all right? Um, so that is that question. But before I come full circle on, on a lot of those things, we're going to get into the interaction with the temple first. Uh, and then we'll have questions about this previous uh, section right here. So let me read uh, the scripture as we go forward, verses 45 through 48, okay? When Jesus entered the temple courts, 
he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. Oh. First question that we might have gotten from the sermon today is, what is the temple? And what is its purpose in ancient, uh, ancient Judaism? Okay. And uh, as we mentioned earlier today, um, the, the temple is the singular place where God is present and uniquely accessible to his people, right? This was the case in the Garden of Eden. God was present. He was accessible. He walked with them. Um, then after sin came, there was a separation. And once uh, God led his people out of Egypt, they were in the wilderness, right? So uh, God, again, wanted to restore to them an access, uh, an intimate, one-of-a-kind way in which even they could be aware of and receive the presence of God, even though he's always present everywhere, right? So he, um, he humbles himself and he stoops down to our level and our understanding to make his presence known to his people. That location is the temple. In the wilderness, once it's led out of Egypt, that presence is the tabernacle, right? Uh, it's the tablets and the Ark of the Covenant and, and the tent of God's dwelling. And it's, it's ornate, it's, it's beautiful. And that is where I doubt where God is. It's at the center of the camp of Israel. Wherever they go, he goes. That is abundantly clear in what he's doing. And then in the building of the temple, once they're led into their own land, it says, you know, let's, let's build this temple. This is a, a holy place, a sacred place. God is present. Now, that's where they sacrifice. Um, that's where they receive forgiveness of their sins. It's where they worship. Uh, it's, it's where they gather to, to hear the word, right? This is a, a monumental place. Uh, and as I've said in the sermon today, uh, it's the place where heaven and earth intersect, okay? It's a beautiful, beautiful place. And so it is wildly important um, to life, to faith, to religion, to relationship with God. Uh, that's what the temple is, okay? That brings us to our uh, second question. Why is Jesus so upset about the merchants in the temple? And we might ask, well, does Jesus hate merchants in general? Should they not have been in the temple in the first place? What is going on? And so, no, Jesus does not hate merchants, right? People need to sell stuff because people need to buy stuff. It's a common vocation. Um, but there was a function for the merchants in the temple. Uh, the merchants would sell sacrificial animals for you to you buy them, you bring them, you sacrifice them, right? Uh, so that was an actual resource that people required. But at the time of um, Jesus, um, you know, the era is called, just for your information, Second Temple Judaism, all right? Um, and to give you a little background, especially with the sermon for today, there is the first temple, the one, you know, laid out by King David and it's constructed by, by Solomon, um, and that's the first temple that is ransacked. It's destroyed by the Babylonian empire. Well, Israel comes back and they rebuild the temple. It's not as nice, not as good, but it's still the temple. That is the second temple. Okay. And, uh, by the time Jesus ministry begins, it's the time of that second temple. So it's referred to as second temple Judaism. Uh, and in second temple Judaism, by that time, uh, in the temple, the, the merchants had gotten a little out of hand, right? Uh, there, there were a lot of them. They were uh, selling, uh, you know, things that they shouldn't have. They were selling at prices that they shouldn't have, right? When the purpose was really, let's make sacrifice accessible to the people and available to the people. Uh, and so uh, it, was becoming, it was becoming gimmicky. It was becoming irreverent, opportunistic, all those kinds of things. And um, in the same way, you know, this is not a to, to throw or, or cast shade on, on any other denomination or anything like that, but uh, I have never been, but have any of you ever been to Rome, to the Vatican, and you go and there's all these gift shops and you can get a plate with a picture of the Pope on it, and you get a t-shirt with the picture of a Pope on it, and you can get a cross that the Pope himself is blessed, and all these different kinds of things, and so it just kind of turns into a big old gift shop. 
Having said that, again, I'm not throwing shade. And in Catholicism, they place high reverence on those things in the Pope himself. And we don't. Um, but it, 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 there can be too much, is my point. Okay. And so Jesus realizes this. So he's upset about these merchants taking advantage of people. Uh, he's upset of the, the point of the temple being perverted. This is, as Jesus says, a house of prayer. It was designed for people to meet God there and offer up all of their needs, their petitions, their thanksgiving, everything like that. It was a relational engagement place, right? Which included sacrifice as well, but it has turned into something else, right? A profiteering, uh, abusive place, okay? So this is why Jesus drives them out. But I don't want to get into too much before we get to the next question. Um, how does Jesus restore and fulfill the true purpose of the temple? This is where we get into the, the last section of scripture. But first, let's kind of stick to this point, right? He drives out the merchants, right? He restores the temple because the, the point is not to buy you know, all these different kinds of things at all these different kinds of prices, but it is to encounter God. It's to be a house of prayer again. Um, and we really get the clue in verse 47, okay? He doesn't just clear the temple out, but what does he do afterwards? He, what does he fill that void with, right? Every day he was teaching at the temple, the life-giving word of God for the people in their presence, okay? And now we start to realize this is not about the building anymore. Something new has come, has been done. And as we learned in the sermon today, there is a new temple. There is a better temple. There is a, an ultimate place where heaven meets earth and God dwells among his people. And that is in the person of Jesus Christ himself. Right? Jesus is our great priest who offers sacrifices for us, or the greatest sacrifice for all, the perfect sacrifice. Uh, he is the one who intercedes for us. He's our mediator uh, with God the Father. Um, he is uh, the, the, the place um, where we lay down our worship. He is the one who brings forgiveness. He's the one who restores. Jesus is uh, the presence of God made flesh walking among us. And even to this day, being among us, right? Jesus has said, as he, after his resurrection, as he ascends, surely I am with you to the very end of the age. Or maybe that was the Great Commission, I'm getting them mixed up. Um, but wherever that scripture comes from, he did say it, okay? Uh, Jesus is with us. He sends the Holy Spirit. Um, it's indwelling in our hearts. And so now the church is the temple, right? Um, we are the hands and feet of Jesus. Where we go, he goes. He never leaves us. And so what used to be only the this connection to this place now is in the spirit with us everywhere we go, everywhere we are. It leads us, it guides us, it directs us, okay? So Jesus, uh, that's just incredible when you think about it. That's something that if you were to tell that to the people of Israel at the time, they would have said, what? What are you talking about? That's crazy. And so now we have Jesus weeping over a, a city, a nation, a people that does not understand how to properly worship. Tear this temple down and I will rebuild it in three days time. He's not talking about the bricks and the mortar. He's not talking about all of those different things. He's talking about himself. And so we have uh, people who don't realize the true temple. They don't realize the true uh, savior of the nation. And so they continue in their ways, in their traditions, in their preconceived notions, all while in a short while rejecting the savior himself. And so Jesus weeps for them. If you, even you had known what was good for you, what would bring you peace, what your true salvation was, but it's hidden from your eyes. They don't see it because they see something else. Now, the bad news is uh, that it would continue like that, and Israel or Jerusalem would again be ransacked. But the good news is that 
in what Jesus has done through the witness of the disciples, the apostles, and the spread of the gospel, even those who were blind at one point would eventually come to see and get uh, and come to faith and be part of the church and receive that salvation. But this was uh, leading up to um, leading up to his passion. Uh, after his prayer uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, remember Jesus says, "The hour of darkness has come." Right? This is a, this is not a season of light. This is a season of darkness. This isn't a season where the devil is currently roaming and having his way as Jesus is about to die. Uh, but a new era is coming through Jesus and what he's about to do here. Um, so hopefully that gives us a little bit more of an understanding in, into the scripture for here. So uh, having said that, we have a couple minutes. Um, if you have any questions, if I went a little too fast and you'd like me to repeat something, if you have any uh, violent objections or comments, yeah, those are welcome as well. Um, but please, please go ahead if you have anything. What a crowd. What a crowd. Uh, okay, well, let's read our concluding thought here and we'll end in a prayer uh, and then that'll be it. As always, Jesus continues to faithfully carry out his mission with humility and urgency. In Jesus, the Lord dwells among his people. Not only is he the perfect temple presence, but he is also a king far beyond human expectation. May we come to realize who he truly is, what he did, and why he did it, so that we can ascribe to Jesus all the glory that he is due and live for him in his upside-down kingdom. Um, yeah, I, I forgot to mention this in the middle of the Bible study, but uh, we keep seeing the upside-down kingdom, right? The, the mighty king who is high up on the horse and everybody looks up to him is like just above eye level on a donkey as he comes in, right? Uh, he, is, he is so humble. He is so good. Um, he is about to do the very last thing that people expected and yet bringing the very thing uh, that they had hoped for in an eternal uh, cosmic scheme. Everything is just flipped in Jesus. And it's only through him that we can understand uh, truly uh, what God has done what he's always said he would do and what he is about to do going forward uh, as Jesus comes back to rescue us all from sin uh, and, and bring a new creation. So that's that. Everybody, let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much um, that even though your own disciples just dimly understood you, if at all, that you were still faithful, that you carried out your mission, that you did what had to be done to have us back with yourself. Lord, would you turn us in faith to you? Would you help us to worship you and follow you for who you actually are, not for who you, uh, we want you to be? And God, just remain with us until you return. As we pray today in, in church, remain our hope and strengthen our hope in you and fill us with the peace that can only come from you. We pray this all in your name, Jesus. Thank you. Amen. All right, friends, I hate to disappoint you, but we're three minutes early. Um, I know you didn't get to bang for your buck, but I'll make it up next time. Maybe. I wanted uh, I'll, to I'll, tell you, Oh yeah, we, go ahead. Won't be, we won't be with you next week because we'll be in Kansas City for our granddaughter's wedding. Oh, so. congratulations. Well, you know, that's okay. Uh, I think the online thing has a little flexibility. So if you want to stay up to date, these will be recorded and on our website, videos, study guides, everything. So you're welcome to do that at home um, or, you know, just continue to read the scripture and your study notes or whatever you got, you'll figure it out, but we're here for you. Uh, congratulations. I hope you have a wonderful time and uh, yeah, we'll see you when you come back. Okay. All right, everybody in person and everybody online, I'm going to pause the recording and sign off. So we'll see you later. Be blessed. Thank you. Babe.